Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Rick, great to have you back and uh, great to be spending time with you. Obviously, we had dinner last night, which was uh, wonderful. Uh, so thanks for coming to Austin. That was such a treat last night, uh, getting to see you in full dad mode and beautiful family and great meal and lots of protein. <laughs> Indeed, lots of protein. So uh, although we're in touch constantly from the standpoint of the listeners, the last time they got to interact with you was... Uh, probably almost exactly three years ago, 2019. Uh, so sometimes when I have folks back on, especially if it's a technical podcast, I kind of want to talk about, okay, well, what's new information since that time? Well, this obviously isn't very technical. Uh, hopefully folks remember a lot of the story uh, that we talked about. Um, but nevertheless, what's, you know, what do you think of as kind of the, um, the highs and lows for you of the last three years? Because I know there have been both. Gosh, Peter, go back uh, to that time. And, and we had a specific conversation about leadership. And we were talking about, you know, leaders are only leaders in a time of crisis. And we had talked about how the last decade had been super benign. And, you know, how do we how do we show up in crisis? And then 60 days later, 90 days later, boom, COVID hits. So a lot <laughs> changed if you think about it. The last three years have been the most tumultuous three years, no matter where you are in the world, not in, not in, not in any one country. Um, and then you layer that with lots and lots of changes. Um, my kids have gone to college. Um, my mother, which we talked a lot about in the podcast and my father-in-law and my aunt, which was like a second mom all passed in that window. Uh, our business went aggressively into offense when the market changed because we saw some opportunities. We bought some very meaningful businesses and then, you know, everything kind of further imploded in one way. And then, you know, and now we're living in, in the middle of a war in the middle of uncertainty and all of that. But, you know, so the world like always keeps changing and surprising us. Uh, we tend to project kind of today's reality into the future, but it's always changing. And how much of your um, even keel around all of these events, personal and professional, do you attribute to, you know, what happened in January of 2009? Um, in terms of perspective, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I, a lot. You know, I, I really, I don't have a lot of lows. I, you know, I, and I don't have a lot of high highs. I just, to me, I, is this this understanding that this too shall pass and um, really doing what you can in the moment when you can is all that you really can do. And if you don't tie yourself up to the outcome as much and you're just really trying to stay in the process, I, I, I really I'm able to navigate this in great part because of that experience. One of the things we spoke about in the first podcast that, uh, you know, you always have these moments of podcasts that sort of stick with you. And, and that's probably true for a listener. It's certainly true for the person doing the interview. Um, there were a handful of moments. One of them was this image of raising children is playing a game of tug of war that you eventually lose. Mm. Now you can't lose it immediately, right. right? You can't just say, ready, go, let go of the rope. Right. But by the time they're you know off to college, they've pulled you over the line, metaphorically. Um, at the time we had that discussion, you were still engaged in that tug of war that yeah. your kids were not yet in college, now they are. I'm in the middle of that game, but, I think about that constantly. Maybe start by retelling a little bit of that and, and, and explaining kind of if at all your thinking has evolved or what you've learned about that game in the last few years. Yeah, so, so that was probably the last meaningful lesson I got from my mom. Um, she had, you know, onset of Alzheimer's and, you know, we, we would have moments of, of, of that. And I, I came and I was having coffee with her and I asked her some advice about our daughter who was in plenty teenagerhood. And what she said was, she said, she looked at me and said, my son, uh, raising teenagers is a tug of war. And then there was this silence. And then she says that you ultimately must lose. Um, and it is, you know, like you said, you know, such a, such an insightful, you know, all encompassing statement about parenting. And it's really the transition from really being, they'll always be your kid, but you will not always be their parent. And it's that transition from no longer being their parent. 
and maybe being more of a coach, maybe be more of an advisor, or a friend, all of that. They'll all you will always treat them like your kids. So in our example, we're on the other side of this. Um, I I don't think of myself anymore as you know the parent. I will always be that, but I'm not the parent. So the conversations are very different, and I love it. Our, there have been times where both of our kids have looked at us and said, "I really appreciate your opinion." But this is what I'm choosing to do. And to me, that's a sign of, you know, really good kind of sense of your own decisions. And we disagree with them, but it is like good to see them in their journey of, of adulting uh, now on their own. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why I'm not looking forward to it, but <laughs> I, I, it's one of those things that you know is healthy, good, important, but. Yeah. You know, but you, have you noticed a difference in teenagerhood and how they start pushing away? Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah. I've always believed that the reason why teenagerhood, teenagers are such a pain is so that you don't miss them when they leave. And I tell you, we love our kids and we're lucky that our kids love us back. But we were we high fived each other when we dropped them off. <laughs> we did not cry. We were like, you know what? They're ready. We're ready. And, uh, and empty nesting is it's a beautiful thing. You know, you still talk to them all the time and you still see them and all that. So, then, you know, but it's uh, then the funny part is that they're doing the same things that drove you crazy. You just don't see it. So <laughs> it doesn't feel as as intense. So let's talk a little bit about, um, well, I want to bring up something that, that happened kind of recently over the summer that I thought was spectacular. So mm. early summer, you, you, you call me and said, Hey, I'm, I'm having a, a get together, uh, in July, uh, you know, a couple of days and I'm inviting, you know, I, you gave me a bunch of details, none of which meant anything to me, right? What I took away from it was you wanted me to come out for a couple of days to, to your home and there was going to be a bunch of other guys there, at least one of whom I knew, but most of whom I did not. And you, you know, you prefaced it by saying, "Look, I know it's a big ask. I know how much you hate to travel. I know, and you will have. I had just come back from travel, and I was just leaving the next day. I would have to fly back and then hop right on a plane. Um, but you really urged me to come. And interestingly, I thought it was a birthday. Yeah. And so I, I sort of committed that I would think about it and then talked about it with my wife and said, you know, I think this is special to Rick. I'm going to go because I have a feeling it's one of those things where I'll spend the entire flight there kicking myself for going. Um, but if I don't go, I suspect months later, I'll kick myself for not going. So there's an asymmetry and regret. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up going. Um, and it had nothing to do with your birthday, which I think was like five months earlier. So that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, exactly. I don't know where I got that from. T tell tell us about kind of what was the motivation for that, and why do you think that ended up being a really special time for? Were there forty of us there or yeah, something? About thirty, yeah, thirty. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, when 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 uh, when you go back through your year, and you go back and ask yourself what was truly memorable of the year. At least in my case, there may be eight or ten things that you will remember. You know well into the future and what is universal about those things is they're usually experiences and they're experiences with people that you have a deep connection with so i have become very very focused on creating experiences with people that i love um, as a way to create memorable moments of the year because I think that really is what we grow old with is the memories. But the memories alone uh, are not enough is the memories with people and the more that kind of the richer. So I wanted to experiment with the concept of, you know, let, let's create a friend summit. Let's bring 30 super interesting friends. The uniqueness of it is everybody's been curated by me. Everybody there was a friend. So I think immediately everybody showed up with like, okay, if they're Rick's friends, I'm, I'm going to be open-minded. I'm not there kind of doing like, what do you do? Who do you are? It's more around how do you know Rick? And then, what, you know, what is interesting about each other? Um, and then, you know, we had a lot of the same participants speak and, you know, that we curated the, 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 the we didn't over orchestrate it, but we curated the agenda. And then we had all sorts of things around food and magician and all this other stuff. Um, and the greatest thing happened, which is one of the things that I love most is when my good friends become great friends. And I know for a fact because I was with Rick Hendrick a week ago and we spent 15 minutes talking about you, about Matt Walker, about other people that you guys all have become friends. And what greater currency in life 
than you know spreading love through friendship and it was a huge home run because everybody there even those who came as a gift to me i think left with the gift of new friends and at our age it's not easy to make good new friends uh and it is something that we can do by leveraging our own friendships and, and you've been good to me in this regard i asked you when i heard you know your interview with with uh with matt i said hey would you introduce me and we had we become dear, dear friends. Like I talk to him all the time. So I don't know. It's it's all around this currency that um, friendships really matter in life. Memories, you know, memorable moments really matter. And how do you bring all that together? Yeah. No. I, I it was I was surprised by the the number of guys I walked away from that meeting with um, who I couldn't wait to see again. And you know, it's like, hey, look, when I'm in LA, I'll give you a call. When you're in Austin, That's you great. give me a call. Um, what, um, what did you learn that, that, uh, during that summit, because there were, you know, there was some structure to it as well, where there were folks that, you know, it was kind of like a bunch of fireside chats effectively. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, did anything surprise you? Did you learn anything? I learned don't schedule something like that right after a vacation because I spent my whole vacation <laughs> thinking about, because I, 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 in essence, kind of interview most people, including you. Uh, so that was a lesson, which is, you know, create some gap between something in, in your relaxing time. Um, I learned that, you know, I think all of us, no matter what, need moments like that where no matter who you are to the outside world, you are you know, you're the one and the same in that group. So, you know, there were professional athletes, there were governors, there were CEOs, there were, you know, true people like are exceptional in their field like you, but everybody there was the same. So I, I think that, that this knows that this essence of like, you know, no, the guard can be down from everybody. And yeah, for me, I just got to like hang out with 30 of my best friends and give lots of hugs and catch up and have moments and create memories. And, you know, relationships take a lot of effort. And that was a really efficient way to like make huge deposits into a bunch of important accounts. I'm blanking on his name, but he he was the older gentleman on the very last day that spoke. Yeah, um, Walter Green. No, or no, no, Marshall not Walter. Rush. I remember Walter. Marshall Rouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, no, yeah. Walter was amazing in his own right, and actually, Walter's someone I want to have on the podcast. Oh. Um, you should. Yeah. So, so you know, it's really funny. We used to be neighbors in San Diego and didn't even know it. Oh, my goodness. Lived in the same neighborhood. Like, lived he, a mile from each other. I love Walter Green. You know, Walter mentors, I don't know, 100 people like us, and we're all better because of it. Yeah. So, so that's, that's someone on our, on, our, on our hit list for, right. for podcast guest. Uh, but, yeah, so Marshall, who's, <laughs> like, I don't know, the guy's 200 years old. <laughs> 99, actually. Yeah. And um, I think from Marshall came one of the most interesting lessons that you drew out. And it's um, a lesson about looking forward versus looking backward and how that ties to age. Do you want to, do you want to recount that story? Yeah. So I've known Marshall about 20 years. Um, I've had, I don't know, a hundred lunches with Marshall. Um, and so when I met him, he was probably 81 82 yeah, yeah. and he was still driving and he'll come in and um and there was something about marshall there is something about marshall that is incredibly appealing and attractive it is that every time you see him once a month every other month he has a list of things that he has learned that he wants to talk about he has ideas about things he wants to do um he's constantly evolving and thinking and what i've learned from marshall is that your age really can be told by what you think about aging of our spirit not of our bodies not of our mind but of our spirit it's really about which mirror you're using are you using the rear view mirror or the windshield right and he is like you know i, I told a story there right where he's like completely worried about one of his kids and really thinking about giving them a tough lesson because it is time and you know he's asking for my opinion and i said mark uh, yeah, I said, Marshall, how old is your son? And he goes, uh, 72. So it was a point of like, you know, he never stopped thinking in, 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 in doing that. And that's how he leaves. He turns 100 in uh, in February and we're going to do something super special, I hope. Cause, the uh, other story I like about him was I think when he was 96 – he came to you with a with a pretty serious business idea, and it was really predicated on trends over the next ten years. 
Correct. And it was like, look, today this isn't necessarily an enormous opportunity, but here's all the data for why 10 years from yes. now, yes. this is a home run. We need to act now and make sure we build this business. And you're sort of thinking, you're 96 years old. Why are you thinking about a business opportunity that's going to you know, mushroom in the next 10 years? You know, and he was a senator for North Carolina for 26 years. There's a highway name after him. He, you know, he, his, his uniqueness, he's a, he's a, um, he's, he's Jewish, but he made all his money selling Christmas ornaments, like all the things that are so <laughs> unique about him. Um, and he's incredibly close to his kids and his grandkids. And, you know, he sees the world so clearly, even when you talk about current events and politics today, he has a wisdom about, you know, he literally played basketball at Duke in 1939, I believe. Hmm. Right. And, you know, he went to World War II. Like this guy and all of that, you know, and he has had tremendous hardships. He lost his wife. He's lost some kids. And, you know, he's, the, the dignity by, by which he handles it is just distilled in a, in a wisdom of life that I find super attractive. I really think, and, and again, this is one of those there's like the soft science and there's the hard science. You know, I, I spend yes. most of my life thinking about the hard science of living longer, the things that we can measure, the metrics we can measure, the biomarkers we can measure, how we can predicate our assumptions of risk based on X, Y, and Z. But there's simply no question that there are these soft metrics that we can't quantify, but they must matter. And I look at my dad as an example of this. So my dad, who is 85 years old, not the healthiest guy in the world, but he has outlived everybody in his completely unhealthy family <laughs> by more than two decades. Yeah. And this is a guy who came from a family where there were you know, nine kids, one died as a child, the other seven have all died. Again, nobody came close to his longevity. And to be clear, he's not remotely a beacon of health. Like, <laughs> Even as know, your dad, huh? No, no, no. I, I wouldn't <laughs> listen to a thing I've said if my life depended on it. <laughs> Never mind the fact that his life depends on it. Um, and look, he probably doesn't have that many years left on this planet. But I deep down believe that his relatively modest longevity, again, relative to what I think his genetic capacity, uh, comes down to exactly this phenomenon, yeah. is everything, he never is looking back. Yeah. He is planning, he is planning, he is built, he's got an idea. I mean, you know, when he, when he should have been retiring, yeah. he was, you know, he, he bought quarries, he bought like swaths of wow. undeveloped limestone land, you know, in his sixties with the idea that this is going to be, you know, there will be a demand for high quality limestone, dolomite and granite in the next 30 years. And, Love it. and that's what he's, he's out there in a quarry every day. B barely able to walk because his knees are so, yeah. you know, messed up. And I'm convinced to my greatest sadness that one day he's going to fall on these rocks and smash his head or something. But yeah. it, it, like the idea of just sitting around yeah. couldn't possibly occur to him, let alone, um, you know, relaxing. Now, again, I, we could talk about whether I think there's some, yeah. maybe one should enjoy life a little bit more. But for him, I think enjoyment is building and is, is, is thinking about opportunity. Yeah. Like, well, you know, yeah. there's this niche for this market of limestone that nobody has really appreciated the value of. And that's where he's going to pour himself into. And that that's, it that's reminded great. me of that yeah, story yeah, yeah. with Marshall. Right? Yeah, and, and I, I have, I've studied uh, a lot of people that are finishing life well. 70s and 80s um, because I'm, I, I think we're all pretty predictable. We just got to find patterns that we relate to that relate to us. And I have lots of friends like, you know, Henry Kravis is a very, very good friend. Henry's in his, you know, mid to late 70s. And you know what? He is a complete stud. And I'm sure he's changed and evolved a lot uh, as, as, you know, as one of the great you know, leaders in Wall Street, but he is, you sit down with him and he has more energy and more passion and he's thinking more about the future. And I think there's something to be said by staying in the arena. You know, even if you downshift, I think there's something to be said to, you know, your brain stays connected, you stay relevant, you don't feel old because you don't feel irrelevant. Um, have you read Arthur Brooks's book uh, From Strength to Strength? 
I've read experts and excerpts. I, I listened to your podcast. I talked to him. Okay. I don't know him as well as you do, but we know each other. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of what he says, it's, it's around this. And this crystallized intelligence that he talks about, I think it's interesting because I am definitely, I, I lack about 30 points of IQ vis-a-vis the two of you. Like, literally, I listen to the podcast and I'm like, all right, I got to pause and go look at some stuff in the dictionary. But I, I, I wonder if the... You know, to me, the the crystallized intelligence is is more to me of the evolution of our brains and the aging of our brain, but a way that we stay productive for the tribe, for the for the society, more than a elevation of. Yeah, it is an evolutionary of. Um, but that not, notwithstanding, I, I I thought your podcast with him was tremendous. Thank you. Um, I, I I really enjoyed speaking with Arthur. I enjoyed his book. I read it twice, and I and I really. It, it, it hit home a lot because even though, you know, I'm not yet 50, there's simply no question I don't have the horsepower I had when I was 20. Mm. I mean, it's, or 25, like mm. where I feel like I was really at my cerebral peak. Mm. And I think, you know, as he talked about and wrote about the transition from fluid to crystallized intelligence, it really gave me some comfort mm. in accepting this transition so that to your point and why I brought this up is, yeah, I think it is important to stay on the field, but I also think it's important to understand that it's okay to move to a different position. Well said. Well said. And I, I think that um, replacing this notion of like, I don't have the horsepower is redefining what that horsepower is. And that gives us continued feeling of growth. I think the importance of life is really not necessarily the looking forward is constantly growing. I think the day that you stop growing is the day you age. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that completely. And, you know, this kind of brings it back to what we talked about a minute ago, which is, I mean, I am sad when I think about my kids not being little and I'm not sure what that's about, mm. but uh, you know, we talked about it very briefly at dinner yesterday because you got to see both my boys in complete action, right? Which right. we're we're not shy about, right? Like we don't make any apology for the fact that they are high energy, you and, shouldn't. and 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 we dude, you totally were love hugging, it. You were so physical. It was I I I really was so yeah. I mean, I, I, I just reminded it, me of my relationship, but I also felt your joy and love. But what, 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 what Jill and I often say to each other, and, and this isn't, you have to say this in the bad times. So yesterday they were well-behaved, yeah. but you know, there's equal number of times when, I mean, you'd think that they're psychotic. I mean, you, you, you can't believe how poorly they behave, you know, like, we've all been there. <laughs> you know, literally you, Jill will kill me for even, even telling this publicly. Like the other day she walked by the youngest one and I don't know where he just took his pencil and stabbed her in the butt. <laughs> unprovoked it's not like she said go to your no. so it's like but in those moments i say i know it can be really hard yeah i will be i would if i could freeze time i would which right. is a totally irrational thing to say yeah why do you think that is why what did you feel that way when you and your kids were at this stage which is you are their world you're still daddy not dad uh, yeah right, right, right. I, I think this is an amazing stage and i feel fortunate to be going through it a little later in life yeah. when I think I can appreciate it. I think had I been presented with this yeah. 20 years earlier, I wouldn't have had yeah. the maturity to embrace it as much maybe. No, I, I think that's I think that's right. Um, you may not have the same energy you would have had, but you have plenty and especially, you know, and I think that's the trade-off uh, that, you, that we have when we have kids younger or older. Uh, you know, I, I think the great thing about having kids is we get to kind of almost relive life. Mm. And I think there's something very subconscious about, you know, rediscovering things or seeing things through their eyes that brings the child back in us. You know, I think that child is a safe place in all of our kind of personas. Uh, I also think that there's this notion of this is how we are relevant in the world. This is how we are going to stay here when we're no longer here is through them, right? Because a lot of us will live through them. And that's why we are so committed to it. Like, and I, I, I just think that it's, and it's such a powerful um, job to have and responsibility that is heightened in every sense, in the good and the bad. And the reality is that, you know, all the things that they're doing 
are just normally growth moments of you know their own brain development and all that good stuff and um you know we talked a lot about it the last time in the podcast but you know and i think we way over parents <laughs> ari the youngest is uh he's just obsessed with math right now you know he's five yeah. he's starting to learn how to add and the other day we were sitting there and he he's he's sitting with me on the couch his reese is who's uh three years older is yeah. sitting you know at his desk doing some coloring and he goes you know when i'm a hundred reese is going to be 103 <laughs> and then he looks at me and he goes how old are you going to be wait 70 oh. <laughs> and i go no i wish buddy i'm gonna be long dead when you're 100 oh, uh, but if i were alive i'd be you know 140 yeah. whatever yeah. um but it's just first of all that's an amazing thought to me because i do think that kids today will quite easily be 100 years old right like i don't yeah, you know yeah, today yeah, yeah, yeah. to be 100 uh to make it to 100 right now is yeah. a pretty remarkable feat Right. Um, you know, centenarians are exceedingly rare, about 0.004% of the population. Yeah. Um, I tend to think that kids that are born now will reach that level at a far greater frequency. Uh, and so it was a bit of a sobering thought, right? It's like, I'm looking at this little chubby, cute kid that I can't stop wanting to squeeze and hug and kiss yeah. and realizing he's going to be a hundred year old man one day and I'll be probably long gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's all of that stuff is sobering. I guess it brings me to the to the idea of how do you I mean, you you strike me as a person for whom a lot of purpose came from your kids. Yeah. And so as your kids are older, do you feel less of that? And has does that has that caused you to put more of your sense of purpose into something we'll talk about later, like philanthropy, which is also very important to you? Uh I know. I I I actually I I'm very challenged by this notion of how do I help evolve our relationship into more of a coaching relationship um, in a way that, you know, I can be still their father, but also be a sounding board amongst, you know, many others. And this morning I had a conversation with my son a lot around something he's dealing with. And I said, I'm going to talk to you as if you were a mentee of mine. And I gave him what I thought as an advice. I said, you got to do whatever you want, but I, I want you to know that I am a resource for you. Uh, and then you're not alone in solving these problems and just like you have other people. And I, I, I really enjoy kind of this, this morphing of the relationship. It's early for us. Um, so I don't, I, but by the way, I, I think that's why people enjoy grandkids so much. It's not that I can give them back when all that, yeah, yeah, that, that kind of really matters. It's, it's a chance to almost do it again. Right. And do it again with lower expectations of like, oh, is it reflecting on me as a parent or is it all this stuff is just, you know, we have this innate desire to perpetuate ourselves. And we do that through our kids. Yeah. You've probably heard me talk about the centenarian decathlon. Uh, of course. And, and for me, one of the greatest motivations personally, and I do find that for many of my patients, because we talk about this in such mm -hmm. detail, um, I think it's true for them also is what they want to be able to do with offspring and mm. more importantly, mm. the children of their offspring. Mm. And um, you've probably seen me do this, but we do an exercise where you kind of build a timeline. Yes, so you'll, yes. you know, you yeah. put your age down and you know, you're, you're, these are your kids. And then you start to estimate the, you know, or bracket, you know, yeah. my kids will likely have kids when they are this age, this age, this age, I will therefore be this age. And, you don't need to spend too long doing this to come to the realization that the things that you want to be able to enjoy doing with your grandkids yeah. uh, will will range from kind of the really extravagant, like I want to take them on the greatest vacation. We're going to go to Egypt and we're going to scale, you know, yeah. the Great Pyramids and go down the Nile. Okay, well, that that's great. Alternatively, it's going to be the really mundane, like yeah. I want to be able to play catch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I wanted to share with you a story that I haven't shared yet, which is, you know, in the in the after the the plane crash, a couple of weeks later, I was watching my daughter perform in kindergarten. It was a really important moment of the realization of like, for now, this is my most important purpose, which is to really kind of help my kids become adults. And uh, it, it came full circle without me knowing it. Um, I was at her graduation from high school. 
Uh, she's a sophomore now in college and they're coming down and it was outside because of COVID and they're coming down this kind of hallway and the same emotion that had not happened for, I don't know, 11 years happened. I started bawling uncontrollably as I saw her. I didn't expect it. It came out of nowhere. I'm not a crier. I'm, I'm not afraid to cry, but I'm not walking around. And it was a realization that I had finally, I had lived to the moment where she had become her own person. And the graduation from high school was a lot more meaningful than just the graduation, at least in my experience. Yeah. It was a realization that she can fly on her own now. Um, and it was, um, it was a moment. It was a moment for me in, in that realization, but then also realizing that, okay, I now have more capacity to broaden purpose. Right? And I think we're all seeking purpose, so it's not like you finish it. It's just you evolve it. Uh, and it was, it was, a, I, I was very grateful to have had that experience because seldomly in life do you get to see the, the end of the circle come back, right? It's usually a line that goes somewhere or nowhere. So when we last spoke, I think you, you talked a little bit about, um, any, any follow-up or interactions you've had with either the crew from, from that flight mm. or Captain Sullenberger himself. Uh, what's, what's the, what's the latest on that? I imagine that, that that's a, I don't remember how many people were on that flight, a hundred and 154 plus the crew, 158, 158 total. So 150, there's 158 of you that, uh, I'm mm. sure some people have passed away due to natural causes mm -hmm. since, but that's a very tight knit group. I'm guessing. Mm. Do you, do you all collectively celebrate that anniversary together? Yeah, there's, there's always something and there's, um, Facebook groups and all that stuff. I've been more on the fringe. I've participated in a couple of things. It's just time, right? And for me, and, and I, I got a lot of what I needed, especially at the time from my closest, you know, kind of friends and family. But you asked me at the last podcast, um, because we were presenting him that award at the Point Sky event that I had, you know, have I seen him enough and why not? And I told you that, um, I was planning to do something well. Uh, it is it is happening, and uh, I don't know if you know this, but the plane itself, which it's worth seeing because mm. it is banged up, like a plane will be banged up if it hit a wall at a hundred and you know fifty some miles an hour. So it it, it really is not the plane; is it's just a shell of the plane. It sits in Charlotte, and for a bunch of different reasons, the all hangar and museum uh, we lost all the facilities. So the airport, they were going to move the plane to Dallas because Wait, it, and it ended up in Charlotte because yeah, that's up, where U.S. Air was yeah, based out of. So just by total coincidence in your backyard. Yeah. And, uh, and then there was a lot of risk that we were going to lose. And there's a bunch of other planes there, but that's the anchor plane. So a number of us rally in the community. And, Is that normal, and, by the way, after a plane wreck that or do they I would have guessed that they normally scrap planes. I think this one because they wanted of the to keep because of the value, significance. Right? Okay. Um, and uh, and so a, gr a group of people in Charlotte Rally and, and I made a donation with, uh, you know, asking for the naming rights. So the thing that I'm going to do to honor Sully and the crew and perpetuate, you know, kind of this notion I was doing my job. Remember that statement uh, is we're going to name the museum after him. And the museum will be in Charlotte. In Charlotte. So it will be the Sullenberger Aviation Museum of the Carolinas or something like that. But it will be his name. And I called him to ask for his permission. Um, and he was interesting, hesitant at first. And then he called me back and, you know, I said, okay, let's do it. And the uh, the naming and all of that will happen in January. Uh, so it will be a big the event. The 14th anniversary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it will be a beautiful day. But, you know, I, just, I wanted to find something that, you know, will outlast both of us and as a way to honor his commitment to doing his craft and to saving our lives. Yeah, it's um I'm by this point in the podcast I think most people if they haven't familiarized themselves with th themselves with this story should probably go back and listen to that that section of our podcast is the way I think you hmm. you tell that story this is probably the longest version you've told of it because obviously you have a TED talk where you go through it in 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 some detail which is really moving but I I think also just the hmm. you know I'm still so remember how I said from our first meeting, there are a couple of things that stand out. The other thing that really stands out from our first podcast, which is something you sort of said in almost passing. Do you know what I'm about to say? Uh, no. Because I've, I've shared this with you, but it's when the plane is coming down and you're going through, once you realize there's about 10 seconds until you're going right, to die, right. um, you said a couple of things. One, it's very calm. 
Mm. Like it's, mm. you weren't scared. Mm. You were sad. You're very sad. And you put your hand on your leg or on your other hand, oh, my arm. on your arm and said, I love you. Mm -hmm. As the last thing you said to yourself before mm -hmm. you would have died. Close my eyes. Yeah. And I was, and I just couldn't believe that. I was like, that's the last thing I'd ever think to say. Mm. Um, what would you have said? I don't know that I, I probably would have said nothing. Mm -hmm. I probably would have just been very sad and, um, and, and yeah, I don't think there would have been any gratitude or anything like that mm -hmm. in me. Mm -hmm. no. Have you, have you actually asked any of the other people on the flight what they did, said, thought in the last 10 seconds? No, but. I have and, and 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 I will because I think it will be interesting. I, I would. I mean, there's a whole book there. Yeah, like that for sure. is for sure. And and remember that we had no suffering. Uh, I imagine if you're dying, you know, in some level of distress, it's it's a different. You know, your mind is in a very different place. Coping. But, but that's what makes this such an interesting quote unquote mm -hmm. control experiment. Yeah. Is yeah, you weren't on fire. Yeah, and it's ninety seconds, so it's not all. It's not. You're just not a. It, you know, a lot of people have near death experience that lasts a second or two seconds, yeah. right? Um, but I, I I've reflected a lot, Peter, on kind of the the TED talk was you know a moment in time and it was all around okay here's kind of the three regrets i felt as as the plane was coming down um and we talked a lot about them in the other podcast but I, you know i we should revisit them by the way just yeah so that folks can see it all in one yeah. place uh so so it was this notion that everything changes in an instant so time really really matters it was this notion that um relationships are at the core of the richness of life but yet we spend a lot of time with our ego you know kind of leading the charge and then this notion with around my kids which is i wasn't living true to kind of what i you know discover was my true purpose at the time or my main main purpose which is seeing my kids and it was the regret that i felt at the time of my look like death to had missed it to had not been clear that that really was the i don't know the the map <laughs> or, the, or the or the or the you know the the key to living you know a better life you know as i reflect on all of that what's interesting is nothing has really changed but it's not around regrets you know i i think um, say more yeah so you know for example i think in, instead of it being around um, everything changes in an instant. So, you know, living the moment, it is that, but it's wrapped around around um, a notion of having true intentionality about how we live our life. And true intentionality about how we live a, lot, a life is a really big, deep bucket that I've spent lots and lots of time thinking about. It has a lot to do with time. Right. And the reality with time, and, and I've heard this and I love it, is like the problem with time is the same problem that we have most things that are free. We don't value it. Right. If we like had to get up and like really spend real money on time, I bet you we will behave differently. Right. And the problem with time is, as we have learned about sleep, is you have to do a lot of things to extend your time. Some so that you're more productive the next day, like sleep and some like nutrition and exercise so that you have more time. Right. So a lot of what you are really trying to do is, you know, convince people that there are things they can do to have more quality and, and meaningful time. But it is a lot more than that. You know, to me, to live with intentionality is around um kind of combining a lot of things into where we spend our energy and what the things that we stop doing and how do we kind of reverse things that we don't want to do. So um, I, I really think that this notion of having complete intention um, is, is really at the core of living a, a more rich life. So I feel my life to be very rich because um, I do, I have like, for example, I, I, I have 242 weeks left until I turn 60. And, you know, I have all these little exercises where I'll say, okay, they, you know, what are my like big intentions this week? Because, you know, at 60, I'm in a different energy level. I'm probably paying a bunch of physical debts back. <laughs> like there's a lot that will come back in, you know, and, and I live in chunks of my life with just great intention. It is because of that. 
because I realize that everything really is you know fleeting, but it's not just around time and time only. And and that manifests itself in, in the second one when you talk around when I you talked about relationships. Um, what I realize is that you know a little bit of the event that we were talking about. I I want to continue to meet new people that I can learn from. I am addicted to learning and growth. And the best way to do that is through other people. So the amount of energy I put into friendships, because it's not relationships. You know, the good news is when you're in business, you have a lot of deal friends. The key is how do you convert them into real friends? Who do you want to convert into real friends? And to be a real friend, talk about a skill to be learned. Like talk about it being a never ending journey. Uh, and and how, how do you approach that? So I'm, I'm really, really, I have an enormous amount of great friends, more than most, because I spent the bulk of my time on that. You know, if you go back to time, there's only three things you can do with it. You can waste it, which a lot of teenagers do. You can use it in things that are, you know, value, and then you can invest it. There's nothing else you can do with time. So the ratio of what you do with those three components has a lot to do with it. So guys like you and I, at least, we don't waste a lot of time. The question is, how much are you using it for things that give you pleasure or things that you want to do? And how much are you investing? And that will ultimately continue to pay dividends in life. So like, if you look at your time, you'll know how much of that it is. And if you're using too much in something, at some point becomes wasteful, if, if you may. So relationships are super rich. And then the last thing is, you know, and this notion of purpose is how do you kind of expand that? So I spent a lot of time trying to continue to evolve the gift. And not look at it as a as a moment in time, but as a as a some level of a map into the into the future. And as I continue to age, what do you think the next um, decade holds for you in terms of red ventures? So mm -hmm. maybe give us a bit of an update on. Um, well, maybe again remind people what red ventures is because it's yeah it's not a. It's not an easy thing <laughs> no, to explain. No. Well, it's not like we make a widget. No, it, you know, I, it, it's funny because I explained it in the last podcast three years ago differently than I'm going to explain it now. It, it really is a basically a private equity platform of companies that we control. So instead of investing as a passive investor, we control a bunch of companies. And we have about 17 companies. Um, but, you know, the those companies, the fact is we don't own 100% of them, but we control all of them. And they're all over the place. They're in Europe, in Brazil. We're starting the first bank in Puerto Rico in 26 years. And then we own a bunch of brands in the U.S., mostly digital brands. We own services companies. So it's, it's just really a platform of um, kind of tech and data and digital and a really, really strong culture and a purposeful place to work. How many employees do you have now? We are up to 4,500 employees. And... When I came out to visit you for a business review circa 2014, mm. 2015, how, how big were you then? 1,200. 1,200. Yeah. Beautiful campus. Thank you. Is it still the same? It's still beautiful. It's just people are not going in as often. <laughs> you know, the world has really changed. Our relationship with world with work has really changed. Um, and for, I, for you know better? I, for both, like anything in life. The, everything has pros and cons. I... I think COVID did a lot of good for society. I think COVID realized that this fixed way that we thought about our relationship with work didn't have to be, and that those rules got established way early in the industrial age for control. And control is a false premise in every regard. Uh, but at the same time, I'll, I'll tell you my reflection on this and what I worry about a little bit, and I know a little bit of a different topic, but... I think that one of the unique things about the U.S., and you don't see this in a lot of other countries, uh, having studied a lot of Latin American countries, is that, you know, the decade between 20 and 30 is a decade of true apprenticeship. And that all these companies and corporations and hospital systems, they're, they're really training people into their second third of life. Uh, so you spend the first decade of your life, hopefully if you're lucky, you have good enough parents where you learn a lot, then school becomes a place you work, and then whatever your profession is, that third decade of life is incredibly important. Uh, and that's where you really built a lot of depth and learn on someone else's nickel and all this stuff. And I worry that we're going to look back in 10 years and the U.S. will have lost mm. a sense of competitiveness because a lot of this 
people coming into the workforce are getting a fraction of the tutoring and coaching and experiences and intuition that they would have had. And 30, 40 years from now, we would have lost a lot of our edge because we stopped investing in the people and their creativity and their skill. Meaning that's a downside of not being in an immersive mm -hmm. culture. At least for that, for that, for that segment of the or yeah. that age of the population now i would argue that you know i think what we learn in COVID is flexibility is king and we should celebrate and look for flexibility and we shouldn't be able to sacrifice raising kids if you're a working mother or working father to, you know to the, the sacrifices that we made or we don't have to travel crazy like we were traveling so a lot of that is you know baked into you know changes in the in, in the rules of engagement but this this is all a moment in time you know if we go into a recession some of these habits may return i hope we never lose the flexibility we gain i don't love going to work every day at the same time and leaving at the end of the day i love having a lot more freedom and i think most people do do we know if i mean presumably there are certain jobs that work really well remotely versus yeah. not. And there are presumably certain types of people who work really well remotely versus not. No. I don't, I, I don't and haven't spent much time sort of looking at any of this, but I imagine given yeah. the size of your company and the footprint of Red Ventures, do you have any insights into that? You know, I think there's two components to that. One is productivity, which is, you know, at least in some functions, fairly easy measured. And, you know, so we have lots of editors that write, um, you know, real content, they, they are as productive or more uh, if they don't have to commute and do lots and lots of things that are distracting in the office. Um, there are some places in engineering where that is also true. Maybe some of the places in the back, you know, back in engineering where you're not doing a lot of collaboration. Um, but by and large, uh, and those people net net, you would argue that, you know, remote, not hybrid, very different things, uh, you know, net net may be more positive. Now, the second side of that equation, I think being alone or being in your home um, every day has a real tax on mental health. I think we, we are, we're, we're designed to be with others. And I don't think we know the real value to, you know, or, or tax on that. Um, now, a lot of the other jobs, hybrid in my opinion, uh, where you're collaborating with people, where you're learning experientially, where you're building intuition, um, it's it's a healthier way uh, to gain expertise on something. Do you mean hybrid like you come in sometimes and you work remote sometimes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of things we do during the week that you don't need to be in a place. But, the, you know, so so my, my hope is that ultimately work evolves into what are the things that require people to be together versus what are not. And then depending on where you are in your career and your, you know, your proficiency, you have even more flexibility. How long do you think you'll be doing Red Ventures as your quote unquote day job mm. versus working on some of the many things that seemingly are of just as much interest to you, but are more on the nonprofit side? You know, I, I feel super healthy in great part thanks to you. <laughs> I, I literally, I, I feel like I've at least slowed down a lot of the aging, uh, and and, uh, and and I'm really grateful. Um, the uh, so as long as I feel healthy, I, I love this perch. I don't back to the Marshall conversation. I don't intend to, you know, I never want to replace happy with happier in anything in life, and I'm happy as can be. You know, and, you know, would it continue to evolve? Yes. Would it continue to, you know, uh, change? And, you know, the one of the the big ahas in COVID, you know, COVID to me was unique in so many ways. I, when I got to do something for a second time, which we usually don't do in life, when something kind of goes away, goes away. The fact that we got our kids home for like a year and a half, uh, it was, it was, it was wonderful. But, you know, I think the, 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 for me, Red Ventures will continue to evolve, but what will happen is a lot of our companies will kind of gain independence. So instead of Red Ventures being one thing, we will find the right outcomes and, you know, in, in marriages of a lot of our businesses with the right partners and allow those people to become CEOs of their own businesses and will create monetization and return for our investors. But our ability to stay private and stay independent and stay away from all the other stuff that public companies have to deal with, it's non-negotiable. So I see Red Ventures in a bizarre way, 
returning to its roots in the next 25 years to a much simpler um, thing where most of our businesses will evolve out. We'll continue to buy businesses in the next 10 years. But my guess is when I turn 80, I'll, I'll have 15 people and we will be hoping to give all our money away. Speaking of giving money away, uh, you've recently signed the giving pledge. Mm, yeah, about a year, a, co- yep. a year and a half ago. So, tell us a bit about that. I mean, I think people have heard of the giving pledge, but what 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 does it mean, and what type of people can sign it, and what what are the implications of it? You know, it was it was not something that we did without a lot of trepidation. You know, we had uh, it, it's something that really um, Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett started, and it was uh, around creating consciousness of the people that have had more luck than others and creating real wealth to uh, create a, a commitment and responsibility that you will give at least fifty percent of that wealth back. That's what the pledge is about, um, and, and that you would is that, that's during your lifetime as well, correct? Yeah, or or when you die, it okay. doesn't matter. But you okay. are you know committing. That's that's the pledge you sign and. There's hundreds of people that have signed it you know, all over the world, right? So it's a bit of a community too, where you learn how to give it in ways that you know, reflect what you want to do and all of that. So there's real value to being part of the community. Uh, when we first, you know, met and we we had we had the privilege of having dinner in Omaha with Warren Buffett, and they were trying to convince people at the time. I, our kids were still in high school, and we didn't want this burden because it it, it does create negative energy around it, and they're Why? you know. Because eh, a lot of people, and I, I, meaning honestly, because it makes public the amount of yeah, wealth it, it that is you a have. threshold. Uh, which at the time we were we were a private company, so no one had known. But when the New York Times wrote an article and all this stuff, it kind of became public what it was. But it's just more. I, I wanted to shelter them from anything that negative that may come out of that, and it's just not. It, it, they were too young, so we waited until they went to college. So when they went to college, um, they called back and said, "Hey, you said when your kids were go to college, you do it." And so we uh when we did and, and we're grateful we did but you know we we planned we were planning to do this anyway and we do it more as a you know as a as a pledge that hopefully others realize that this only works if it works for everybody it doesn't work if it works only for a few and you know putting it back into the system at, in, in the core that's what you're hoping to do did you ever hear the podcast i did with john arnold i did not Okay, so definitely one you'll want to listen to. So John and Laura Arnold, um, who've also signed the Giving Pledge, are probably two of the most deliberate philanthropists I've ever met. Um, John uh, was, I think you could say, hands down, the most successful energy trader in the history of energy trading. Wow! Um, and he um, he was a he was a um, a trader at Enron mm. at, right out of college, and became their most successful trader. In fact, I. I if I'm not mistaken, I think his personal book of business was generating a billion dollars a year for Enron, wow. just his own personal trades. Uh, when Enron imploded, you know, he was handed a severance check of something like $5 million and he took every penny of it, put it into his fund and went on a 10 year tear of unparalleled returns, something like 30% per month oh, oh, per month. Oh, Okay. So, you know, at the time that John shut his fund down, which I think was 2011 or 2012, before the age of 40, uh, he basically completely turned himself to what he's been doing for the last 10 years, which is just philanthropy, but doing it with a level of rigor and analytics that, um, in other words, he's done something that I think is really interesting and highlights something really hard, which is it's actually not that easy to give away billions of dollars. Mm. Um, I mean, if you want to do it intelligently, I mean, you can obviously give money to entities that, you know, build buildings, Mm -hmm. you know, um, build a hospital. Those things are, those things are great. But, you know, when you look at the sort of projects that John is interested in, um, it takes time. Mm -hmm. And I think John and his wife correctly came to the realization that they can't, wait until they're, you know, 65 to start doing this. They will run out of time because they have too much money. Um, How do you think about that balance? Um, Because I know there are things that you are really committed to. Uh, Maybe we can talk about some of those things. The two that jump to mind, of course, are uh, the children, uh, you know, sort of, I forget the exact name for for undocumented kids kids who, who are 
you know, born here, or not born here, but brought here young, educated here, and then right. can't work. Right. Um, and then of course, a lot of the disaster relief in Puerto Rico, but also just infrastructure and building up there. So uh, let's, let's talk a bit about these things. So first, I, I, I really think that only governments have the muscle to really solve problems. And I think even people with the wealth of Bill and Melinda Gates have come to a lot of that conclusion. You, know, you can attack singular problems and maybe you know, eradicate a disease or something like that if you have billions and billions of dollars. But true systemic issues, I think the role of any you know, nonprofit is to gain momentum, to create a roadmap, to create the case mm -hmm. for governments to really put real funding behind things or just create the systemic changes to change it. So I don't, I don't think that the illusion, uh, illusion of like, <laughs> we're going to fix a real issue. I, to me, this is more around. But, you know, but there is something you, or, and when I say you, I don't just mean you personally, yeah. but I mean, there are, there is something that the philanthropist can do that the government won't do, which is you can take a risk financially that a government can't do. You can demonstrate a proof of principle exactly. that, as you said, then becomes a template or roadmap yeah. for a policymaker to say, well, here's a pilot study that was done that demonstrated X, Y, and Z. This was very high risk. We never would have done it, but oh my God, look what we learned. Right. This is now something that could be replicated at scale. 100%. And you bring in, so in other words, the, the private, uh, the, the philanthropist can effectively function as the angel investor mm -hmm. or the early stage VC that's, and the government comes in yeah, as yeah, the yeah. PE investor. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in that regard, I think yeah, bringing an entrepreneurial spirit and, and, and putting real kind of business savviness behind it is really important. So I, I, I do believe that, but I, I love the, I think it was Jeff Bezos a, a long time ago. He said something around, you know, in, 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 in philanthropy, you're not really necessarily looking for the perfect business plan. You know, if you're helping somebody, you're doing good. Right? And that's a little of my approach, like do things that are good for the world and good and, and it's good for one person, then you're doing something and trying to do it in scale and with purpose and, and all of that. Um, as it relates to what we're doing, Peter, it's, you know, it keeps evolving. You know, we, we've now, we're really focused on this, um, you know, 16 to 24, that's our concentration on people that are under resource. And it is more than undocumented kids, although we just close our applications again. And these kids are still in limbo, meaning, you know, there's, there's still, there's no path to anything. They just have this basically uh, permit that gets renewed, but no one can get the permit anymore. So every year about 80,000 kids are graduating high school that you know, have no ability to get a work permit. It's just insane. It, it is insane. And so, we, so just so people understand, these are kids that came here undocumented. So they're born in another country. They've come here. They've grown up here, though. They've gone to high school here. They could go to college, but they wouldn't get financial aid because, of course, they're not residents. Um, so w tell me what actually happens. What? How many of them say, yeah. I have to go back to the country I was born in versus I'm going to get in college and somehow take a bunch of debt uh yeah, yeah, yeah. without any financial aid like w w my my guess is that 95 percent of them end up taking minimum wage jobs or kind of um jobs that are you know underground and, and stuff like that like we're we're, we're we're because you really you know now there was a process there where you can get a daca permit and there's there's 650,000 of these kids that have daca permits so you can you can work unfortunately about that you know in the last administration daca got rescinded so there's no new DACA. So if you're a high school student and you're 17, you know, you can't get a, a work permit. So at that point, you were grow, you grew up here, your family's now here. Going back to your original country of country to origin may happen, but it's really, really hard. You have no roots there, you have no resources. You may not even know the language for that matter. Right. So I think that that's the that's the craziness of this. We, we where, have where, what's the distribution of where these kids are from? Do we have a sense? Probably ninety percent Latin America. Um, probably two thirds of those Mexico, just because of how they come in illegally. Yep. Um, but you know, but you see them a lot from Southeast Asia and, and other places. We just our our yearly scholarship uh, grant. We just got twelve hundred applicants. Uh, literally close last week. I believe over three hundred of them have uh, close to a four point oh. On so you're, GPA. you're providing scholarships for these kids to go to college because they don't need to be residents to go to college. They just need the funding. The funding. Yeah. So you don't get in, you don't get federal financial aid and about half the states don't give you in-state tuition. So it's almost like you would have to go to school as a, you know, to a private school and pay, 
60, 70 grand a year. And is the investment you're making, Rick, that if these kids crush it in college, they're going to get an H-1B visa on the back end, or they're going to they're going to land in some legitimate dual intent visa with a path to citizenship based on their education. Well, until three years ago, because they were all DACA, they had a path to getting jobs, and there's many now that have jobs. Right? We we put we have 520 kids in the program. About half of them are graduating, uh, but we keep thinking this is the last year. This is the last year because Congress Congress just needs to pass a law, right? And you know, they, there's plenty of reasons why it hasn't happened. But now the kids that are going to start graduating next year, they're literally in limbo because they can't get a work permit. So the H-1B visa and all of that can't do it. You can figure out a way to marry and then take that route. You can look for asylum. But those are all really, really hard paths. I didn't uh, realize that. Do. So you're telling me that if a kid goes through a scholarship, oh, because they're not doing it on an F-1. That they're not DACA. Right? DACA was, um, yeah, exactly. See, that that expired. See, doesn't exist. That's the argument now is like, not only do you have the DACA kids in limbo, but now you're like, you know, there's 80,000 kids every year that were. And the crazy thing is we invest in them in primary school and secondary school. We don't ask the question when they go to our school systems. But then, you know, we invest all that money. Why don't we make them taxpayers? <laughs> you know, we, we have a, an issue. There's like this massive decline of kids applying to college. We have all this college infrastructure with not enough students today. Why, why not educate them and make them pay taxes and give them a path, whatever that is, to citizenship? So, so to me, this is one of those things that makes absolutely no sense. But to ex you know, what we did is we expanded that to, you know, after the George Floyd event, we we as a company kind of rally around. We, we have to find opportunities into our inner cities and have used a lot of the same platform to broaden it. It's called Road to Hire, where Golden Door Scholars is a part of it. But here's something really cool. We, we start teaching coding uh, in North Carolina. Um, mostly black and brown students, mostly from Title I schools. We go into the high schools and start teaching there. Uh, and then we do an apprenticeship program, and then we partner up with all the corporations in Charlotte. We are graduating more black and brown kids with computer science expertise than the whole North Carolina system is now. This year, we have over 220 of these kids graduating. And they all have jobs on the other end. So we give them an apprenticeship and then we have a whole different- Sorry, these are high school or college? No, these are, these are um, they're not going to college. These are kids that are 22, 23, 24, mostly black and brown kids that we're teaching them how to code. We pay them to teach. So they're high school grads that didn't go to college. We give them a two year apprenticeship where we're paying them on behalf of all this corporation. And it's working tremendously. Here's the crazy thing. This 21 year old kid who was driving Uber after two years of the apprenticeship, they are as competent in technology as someone who graduated from NC State. Now, um, how do you think that can be scaled? What do you think is the magic in that? That because yeah. to your this yeah, is a yeah, great yeah. example of what we said earlier. Yeah. You can't solve that problem across the mm -hmm. country, but can you provide a roadmap for that? Well, there's like you start with the jobs, like and at the end of the day, there's you know, hundreds and tons, hundreds of thousands of jobs that are unfilled because they don't have the skills. So pick this. By the way, it's the same thing with high school teachers today. There's a shortage of like. I believe is 350,000 teaching, you know, vacancies that is projected to be, but we get, we pay 42,000 in most states and you can't, it's a crazy, right? But, but keep on technology where there's, there's a big gap. The, the reason our system, our, our, our model works in Charlotte and North Carolina is because it rides on the rails of the system. It literally partners with the county and it partners with the city. It partners with the schools, with the high school systems, all Title I. It connects to the um, to the public school. So, like, there's a lot here. And then the corporations all basically offer a job on the other end. The key to this is to start with a job and then train into the job versus start with education and hope they get a job. So, go fill the job that is not getting filled. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, solve the diversity challenge that all these corporations have, solve a lot of the other issues, but don't show up into the, you know, into, into the nonprofit arm of a corporation, solve a problem that they really have. And that's the connection. So I think it, it will have to happen more at the city level. So there's a big initiative uh, called 110 that a number of like high profile CEOs have built to try to do this. 
It just takes a long, long time. And my, my concern is when the economy turns, these are the kinds of things that get scrapped. Um, these are the kinds of things that people stop giving that job for or investing in. Yet we go back to this you know, negative spiral that, that we tend to have. Obviously, you and I both are kind of cut from the same cloth, which is that of immigrants. And mm. um, I think with that comes a little bit of disbelief as to why the U.S. would not, as a, as a country, want to embrace mm. an amazing asset. Mm. Um, do you see this changing? Do you see this as just being a season? Um, I do. You know, I, I am super optimistic on our country. You know, and that, you know for as flawed as we are, I, I would rather be nowhere else. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, there's just things, unfortunately, take time. You know, I'm reading a book called Brothers about, you know, the Kennedys. And you realize that there were real serious issues there around, you know, the mob and like all these things that, you know, we don't hear about today. So I, I, I do believe that the trend line is up. It's just not linear and it's not fast enough. So, um, you know, I, and I, think I think we just have more information much of which if not all of most of which is noise that distracts yeah. us a little bit yeah. so so i think back in the 60s there's no question it was a more tumultuous era i mean there were political assassinations yes, yes. on u.s soil right. right like we don't have anything like that today um knock on wood but but the noise today is yeah. unbearable yeah it's unbearable. right the never-ending right. cycle of nonsense yeah. news yeah. cable social media, I think makes it feel more dramatic. Um, but that could also be the undoing, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, and these are pendulums. I think we are at a pendulum right right now where the country is super divided. I am super, I, I believe that there will be a series of leaders in our future that will bring us back together. We need a common enemy. And, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it is this risk of China that becomes our galvanizing thing. You know, why, why, you know, I, I find it super interesting when there's a real crisis in our country, 9-11 or even, you know, COVID at the beginning, like we all kind of are behave like Americans. Uh, and then, you know, we need something that brings us back to being Americans and not Republicans or Democrats or black or white and all that stuff. And the common enemy tends to do that. And I think this, uh, this peaceful times have allowed for a lot of room for us to subdivide. So, so Rick, let's let's uh, let's pivot a little bit to talk about health, which is um, you know you're a very health conscious guy, um, but uh, there's also been some changes I, I think in your life over the past I don't know I, I think I've known you now for nine years. Um, basketball used to be kind of the only thing you did for exercise, which was great because it kept you running around a court, but you know you're, you can get be prone to injuries and things like that. Um, how would you describe overall kind of your mentality towards your your health, your longevity? What changes have, have you made? One of my favorites, which I'm sure you'll get to, is your approach to your body weight, which cracks me up. It is. Um, you know, I, I realized that I want to be here for as long as I can, and I want to be here in as you know active of a way as I can. So I, I, I really... Um, I'm committed to that, you know, it's this notion of time, but it's time on the other way. Um, so for the first time ever in the last, you know, especially in the last four years, I've gotten into the gym and I have a trainer and we go through it. I you know, don't do the crazy stuff you do, but I would argue that I am so much stronger from grip to balance to all the things. And, you know, I try my version of it because I, I don't consider myself to be an elite kind of <laughs> athlete in that regard, but I feel so much better. Um, I transitioned from basketball, so I played my last official pickup game about three months ago and I had a bunch of pros come and it was great because it's been such a great language for me and so many relationships came through basketball, so much self-learning and self-awareness and I now picked up tennis and, you know. You know well, now, like, why did you do that? I mean, why, why did you completely stop playing your favorite sport? Because I watch a lot of people my age um, just blow an Achilles and a knee and all of that. And you know what? Those are all signals that we should listen to. I didn't want to get to that place. And now the more I play, the more my knees were sore. And, you know, my body's talking to me. It actually talks to us all the time. 
And I wanted to leave on my terms. And mm. I wanted to leave knowing that, you know, it, it served its purpose. I, it doesn't control me. And I love, I, I picked up tennis in the pandemic and it's something that we're doing more as a family, but I, I love the apprenticeship, the struggle. So I have a coach, I go twice a week. It's a great workout. I get my heart rate to 130, again, to zone two. I stay there for an hour. So I get a lot of, you know, multiple values and, and I'm really not good. And, you know, footwork is different. Everything is different. And I love the grinding of, you know, things. And it's a reminder of humility. Like, you know, everything that we now take for granted that we think we're so good at at some point was really, really hard. So I have now a list of things. Like, I, you know, it's embarrassing. I'm Puerto Rican. I don't know how to dance salsa. Like, I can't die as the only Puerto Rican who can't die but dance salsa. So I have a list. I, I want to, you know, we, even last night you were grilling. And I'm like, I used to grill a lot more. And so I have this notion now that I, I want to keep learning things. I have a list of about eight or nine things. Uh, and eventually, if we end up living part of the years in another country, that language I want to try to engage in. And it's just this notion I don't want to get old, but I want to get don't want to get old not by my age. But I don't want to get old by stop. Uh, so stop how, I want to talk about that last game of pickup basketball. Yeah. How sad was that? Zero. Really? No, I'm grateful for what I had now because it ended. It's life. You know, I don't, you know, it, it kind of leads to the biggest self growth I've had since the plane was in that middle bucket of like relationships. And what I realized, Peter, is that the most important relationship we have, the most important friend we have is ourselves. And that unless we get that right, everything else will have a lot of friction. Everything else will be a version of, a, a, a worse version of what it can be. And what I've realized as I study this is that we in society, and it's I think it's almost every religion, I want to say almost all, and all because I don't know, but most religions that I know are anchoring some level of guilt. And guilt as a way of teaching us or as keeping us connected to something. And I've realized that guilt is the most useless emotion one can have. And I have spent the last five years just basically getting rid of guilt to the point that I joke that it's a complex I no longer suffer from. <laughs> I still have others, but I feel no guilt. And when you feel no guilt, what you realize is that you can change the dialogue that you have with yourself. I am super kind to myself. I constantly make mistakes. I constantly do things and I'm like, oh gosh, that wasn't right. Or I don't show up the way I need to show up. But I have, I have, I have nothing but love for myself. I will say thanks. Yeah, that wasn't your best. Okay, what well, next one so, it so is? And help me understand that. So, so you, it's hard for me to imagine you showing up as poorly as I can. But let's say you, you're in sort of a pissy mood. You come home. Yeah. yeah. You had asked your wife to do something earlier. It's not done. Yeah. Instead of saying, "Hey, sweetie, did you did you have a chance to do that thing I asked you to do before?" You sort of snip at her. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever done that. It happens. Yes. Okay. How do you? Because it's, I think it's really easy to feel bad and feel shame for snapping at her, and then that actually impairs your next interaction. So, yeah. how? But how do you break that cycle? I own it. I because it just takes a little bit of time. It's like I'm sorry. I just took out something on you that it was not on you. That was unfair. I hope you forgive me. How long does it take you to man up to that? It's not long. You know, maybe twenty minutes, thirty minutes. Like, okay. like, like you're very self-aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and and you can read body language. You know, like you know, you can see that what you just said kind of cut through in a way, and then you're like, huh, what what did I do? But 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 more importantly is I don't I don't feel bad. Like I don't I don't carry this notion of like, oh my goodness, I I just did this. Even like even if I do something that I didn't want to do, I just said okay. It's just it's part of being human. It's part of growing up. It's part of learning. It's part of your humanity. But do you think that that can only happen because you're able to immediately make amends? I think it's a habit. I think we 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 walk around. So how do you break that habit then? I mean, guilt yeah. is a pretty strong habit for a number of people, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, it's like any habit. It may be worse than smoking. Uh, smoking is hard. I never smoked, but it's a really habit. But if you want to break it, you break it. You know, you're, you're 98% of your thoughts are with yourself. So first of all, you got to be very aware of all your thoughts. 
and you got to be able to objectivize what you're hearing and you have to be able to evaluate and say you know what is this productive is this helping me or am i doing this because i've always done it or because this is how my parents kind of related to it and i think the more we move away from the emotion of guilt and become it, it becomes self-love it becomes you know a notion like the safest place for us to be is with ourselves uh, and the kindest place to be is in our own heads. And there's no judgment. There's no anything. Like life becomes so much simpler. And then that that you give yourself, you can give to others. Because, you know, when we talk about purpose, you know, we're very lucky that we can impact people. Through your platform, you're impacting lots of us. And, you know, I'm lucky that in my platform I can impact people. But you impact people every day with little things. How you show up to the coffee shop in the morning the type of connection that you make, the taking time, like all of that is making an impact. And the more that you feel a peace inside, the more you want to give it. So I am now addicted really to like good energy. And that doesn't mean it's maybe 95% of the time, but oh, I love that place. And I give it and I give it freely. And I give it with, you know, not expecting nothing in return. And to me, this is like the, the happy place. I live in a happy place. What do you think is the relationship between happiness and wealth? Um, do you think they're uncoupled? Do you think they're correlated positively? Do you think they're correlated negatively? I think we decide what they are. You know, I think, you know, some of the happiest people in the world have no wealth, so they cannot be coupled. Now, wealth can give you a set of conveniences that allows you to solve for whatever your priorities are you know, my, may, may heighten your ability to do that and therefore it gives you more happiness. Or, like in many people, you pursue wealth your whole life because that's what our society wants. And when you get there, you just feel so empty and then you feel so guilty for all you sacrifice for it. And you're in the worst place, which is you got what you wanted and it was a mirage and it meant nothing. And there are so many people out there that feel like, oh my goodness, I was running the wrong race. You know, we talk a lot in life, Peter, around the best way to run a race. No one steps back and asks, am I running the right race? And I think really focusing on, you know, reevaluating the race you're running. So when you ask me questions about, you know, Red Ventures in 10, 20 years, I made it very clear after my, you know, my plane event that I was going to run a different race than everybody else. I wasn't looking for, you know, being... You know, public i wasn't looking for being the wealthiest i wasn't looking for I, my race was to enjoy the race and to enjoy the race i am crazy so i love growing i love being challenged i love competing but I, I i give no power to anybody and i try really hard not to take power away from anybody what do you think are the ways that that people even inadvertently take power away from people you know we as leaders you know can can overlead uh, and not let other people's have, you know, kind of the, the, let them be celebrated and not take all the, all the, all the credit for things, or on the contrary, take responsibility for things that may not have been truly your responsibility. So I think, I think leaders have an ability to really, um, manage the, the, the kind of the power equation with intentionality. Um, I think how you treat somebody, like, I think, uh, we talked about this in the last conversation, but I think the best way we can parent is by showing our kids how to treat strangers and how we, you know, give people respect no matter who they are or what they're doing. And how do we not give anybody too much respect just because society made them be something, you know, everybody puts their pants on the same way. Everybody has insecurities. Everybody has issues. You know, when you look at people as like, you know, we all are in this like imperfect journey with imperfections, it just makes it really kind of level field and, and, and simpler. One of the really enjoyable, I mean, there were so many, but cer certainly one of the enjoyable highlights of the Friends Summit was when Simon Sinek got up and talked about finite versus infinite games, which of course is the name of a, a book. Mm -hmm. Um Maybe for folks that aren't familiar with that, I know it's a book that you love as well. Yeah. Um, how do you implement uh, that ethos into yeah. both your business and your uh, your life? You know, when Simon sent me an early book and said, hey, what do you think? I, it was almost like he was writing what 
it was in my brain. I just don't have an ability to write a book. But he wrote a book. I'm like, and he he actually was rewriting a book by somebody that had come before, right? He had put it in more modern terms. Um, and it became kind of codifying a language that I really believe in. And that the core of the infinite game is that there's a bunch of principles of the game and how you play the game and all of that. But the core of the infinite game is that there's no winning. That the whole objective of the game is to stay in the game. The reality is, if you really read into it, the, the real, real ultimate objective is not just to stay in the game, but to perpetuate the game. So what you're doing through your podcast, through your book that's coming out, through your kids, through everything else, is you're perpetuating the game, you know, the game that matters to you. And that's living with purpose because you are now, you have a purpose of what you're doing. I feel the same way. So when you give up the winning or losing, when you don't look at things, you give away a lot of the, you know, the jealousy. Like, I don't feel jealousy. Like, I don't like, it's, it's, it's an emotion that I'm like, you know, I'm just because you have, it doesn't mean I don't have it. Um, you know, maybe a little envious at times. Like, wow, I wish I had the knowledge that Peter has about this stuff, but zero jealousy. Right. So the infinite game, it makes it really, really simple not to get caught up on winning or losing just makes it and like, just play the game. And therefore we give away, we get away from back to this notion of like, oh, you know, I came in second, I came in third. And you and I have talked a lot about this kind of stuff. It's like, and by the way, I don't think it affects the outcome at all. <laughs> you know, I think you end Is up that something that you have the luxury of playing because you run a private company? But if, if, mm. if Red Ventures were a public company, would you be able to, 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 to live by that? Or would quarterly earnings and other metrics that shareholders would be privy to and have an interest in change that? In other words, do, do public markets demand winning? I, I think by and large, yes. Now, you could argue that Jeff Bezos at Amazon forever never made money, even though the public markets were demanding that he did this. And he basically said, no, I'm not. I'm going to continue to lose money and you're either going to like my story or not. Um, you, could, you could argue that Elon Musk is playing the infinite game in many ways with the decisions he's making. And even, even Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, with you Meta, know, like with sure. Meta, like, you know, he clearly <laughs> has he's lost taking a know, short -term meeting, 75 percent of the value of the company. So I think you can do it. You just have to have the temperament and the stomach yeah. to be unpopular. And you know what? The best way to be that to not be unpopular is not to read. I don't read anything about us, about me. Like, I, it doesn't matter. The opinion of a stranger has zero value to mm -hmm. me. Now, if you call me and say, dude, I, I heard you say this or do this, and that feels like not you, I will listen because I know that you know me and you care. So, like, I have no desire to be popular with people I don't know. I want to re be respected by people that I care about. That's an amazing lesson. That to me is a very difficult feature of living in the world today, right? It's, mm -hmm. do you do you look at what people are saying about you on social media? Do you read comments? Do you? Um, not very often, but a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, I, I, I would say I'm probably 95% compliant with the notion of ignoring it. And when I do read it, I'm rarely perturbed by it, largely for the reasons that you put forth, yeah, which is yeah, you understand great. that it's kind of irrelevant. Yeah. Um, but I can't imagine what it would be like to be doing that from a real stage, right? I mean, look, I'm kind of a nobody, but I mean, could you imagine being Mark Zuckerberg, for example? You know, I think he doesn't care. Yeah, no, I mean, no, 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 like, no, no, no. Meaning he's a made man at a place where yeah. whatever, I, you know, but I think I think it's only relevant, Peter. Like there's no stage that is different or bigger than ours. Like there's just different stages. Just because someone is has a bigger platform than we do doesn't make their stage more important than our platform. Like we're all the same. No, I think it just means that the 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 attacks are louder potentially. But doesn't yeah. matter if you don't read him. If well, you stay no. true to yourself, it yeah, is all yeah. circular logic. Yeah. Have you imparted a lesson like this on your kids? I mean, they're, we've talked about this a little bit on our first yeah. discussion, right? You, you made an interesting point that I think is, uh, I've thought a lot about actually. Uh, I think I had historically thought of it as our kids have it so much easier than we did because, mm -hmm. you know, 
we came from little, they come from plenty, you know, good reasons going on and on. You made a, I think it was a, I think you framed it this way, but this is certainly how I think about it is I feel like me from my parents, from their parents, from their parents, there was an inevitable trend that the child would exceed the accomplishments mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. parents. That was just the nature of moving from the industrial revolution right. to now. And maybe it's our kids that will be the first one for whom it's not just going to be falling off a log to exceed the accomplishments of their parents in whatever metric we use to think about that. Mm -hmm. And you, you came at that from a real point of empathy, mm -hmm. which is <clears throat> I want to make sure my kids aren't under some unnecessary, unrealistic pressure that they have to do something that their parents did. Um, <clears throat> say more about that. And has, has, how has your thinking yeah, sharpened? Uh, it's, it, it, it stems from the premise. I think our kids have a lot more comfort. They have a lot more access. They have a lot more experiences, but that's different. You know, if, if you're defining this about feeling a level of satisfaction with life or a level of happiness back to what we've been talking about there's two separate things they're divorced from one another they don't they shouldn't tie i think the fact that we're starting with the premise that achieving more than your parents financially is the objective of life is like a goofy starting point right yeah. i think what i would love my kids is to feel like they you know were able given the opportunity to really find their gift uh, and to do it with in a place of love and that they are great parents. And then as a result, you know, we as a family did good in the world. And I, I tell you, it, it is to me, all, none of these things kind of make any sense when people are like, oh, we don't know, we're, you know, I just think it's hard. It's hard when, you know, you are Peter Atia's daughter uh, or Peter Atia's sons. And, you know, I think we should be mindful of that, not be, because it's a burden that is put on them by others that they don't know how to accept, you know. Um, that's what I really meant by that. So yeah. I don't. I saw a really interesting clip. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to find it for the show notes. It was Arnold Schwarzenegger, a very young Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I'm guessing he would have been late seventies, early eighties. So had, had, al had already accomplished a lot, but obviously had more to accomplish, right? This is before he would have become the world's biggest movie star and go on to become the governor. Um, but he was being asked, and I think it was like Barbara Walters, or, but it was it was some you know highbrow interview. So it must have been the eighties by this point. Um, what accounts for your greatness? Yeah. Um, and, and he sort of said, "Look, um, t for to have this level, he's referring to his own level of drive. It, it must come from a place of hardship." And it, 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 you know, he, he more, much more eloquently than this described that yeah, basically yeah, yeah. everything he has comes from a singular focus of escaping and being better than yeah, and yeah. improving. And he said, look, the reality of it is kids who don't come for this, if your kids don't come from this level of deprivation, yeah. um, they can't be great. They can be very well adjusted. And that's really the best thing you can hope for them, but they can't be great. And and I really thought about it a lot. I was like, that's really interesting. There's a lot to reflect on there. Because yeah, first yeah, of all, yeah. there's nothing wrong with being well-adjusted. Yeah. It could be a perfectly oh, reasonable yeah. goal for kids who come from privilege, uh, you know, kids who have are never to want anything to be perfectly well-adjusted. But he's arguing that's the best case scenario. But great in what well, great I, at I, lifting weights great at being a being, movie star being like, exceptional yes being, 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 so that's different because you can right. be a great human being you yeah. can have a great like being the elite one percent of something has a max amount of, uh, it has a huge amount of tax on other things absolutely and, and i don't and, think look i mean that's the irony i guess of his life is yeah, you know he couldn't he couldn't see the crystal ball of the lows that would come with the highs yeah and it's and you know and to me that's the problem with hyper successful people mm -hmm. they're trying to repeat what they did and ends up being more self-destructive than not and do you are i would argue that most people can't handle greatness because it is addictive or greatness as it's reflected by being the best at something or the very best so for a period of time and those who are able to accept the fact that none of that matters and it will change and evolve live better lives what do you want for your kid to be the greatest at something for a moment in time and yeah, miserable? Or do I, I, you well, want I him to be, you know, not self-adjusted because that to me is like a consolation prize. No, no, but I, don't, but I, be, I think being well-adjusted is, is a fantastic 
uh, objective, frankly. Yeah. I, uh, and, and I agree with you completely. I, I wouldn't, um, which actually, by the way, kind of is just a very extreme version of the yin and the yang between uh, fluid fluid and, and crystallized intelligence. The more extreme one is, the harder, you know, the more extreme your fluidized intelligence is, it point. might be harder to make that transition to crystallized intelligence. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Because and that's true in intelligence, but I think that's even more true in, um, you know, what is it like to be Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan? Yeah, I mean, that, that's why I think really, really great like four oh perfect students struggle to be super productive in life because they never had to deal with adversity. They never had to be coached. They've never had to be in a place where they're they're forced to be good at it. And you know, like it is better to um struggle so that you learn to struggle than to be great at something. Because life is full of potential struggles. Well Rick, as always Awesome to sit down and catch up on life. Um, congratulations on on all of your successes in the in the past couple of years in particular. And um, I'm really excited to hear about this museum in North Carolina. I think uh, the next time I come out to visit you, I hope we can make the time to go and see it because I would actually love to see that. No, I would love that, Peter. And you know, I I can't say it enough to you. You've had an incredible impact on my knowledge of you know of, of myself and exercise and nutrition and how i'm gonna live and you know i might hope I'm, i know that the last 10 years of my life i should uh i should name after you because you've done <laughs> you you've helped me a lot and i love our friendship and i love how we can be so honest with each other and raw and i'm, I'm humble you would have me especially a second time so great fun thanks rick <laughs>